From low-income students to seniors, South Florida's most vulnerable communities are being left behind as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to push the world into the virtual age. We look at these impacts and resources to help close the expanding digital divide. Stay with us as we dive into your South Florida. Hello and welcome to Your South Florida. I'm Rick Christie, editorial page editor of the Palm Beach Post, filling in for Pam Giganti. This month, we're looking at the pandemic's impact on the digital divide. That's the gap between those who have access to computers and the internet and those that do not. From online learning to working remotely, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced all of us into a more fully virtual age, worsening this digital divide particularly for low-income and minority communities. In our most recent virtual town hall, I was joined by Code Fever Miami and Black Tech Week co-founder Felicia Hatcher, Quantum Foundation President Eric Kelly, and South Florida Digital Alliance Executive Director Don Slesnick to learn more about the causes of the digital divide and ways to help those most at risk of falling behind. Felicia, let's start with you, and uh, so you can get us uh, get us going with this. What's the root cause of this issue, and what communities have been historically impacted, and why? You know, the digital divide has long existed, right? And then I think we went through uh, quite a few years where we thought that we had solved the problem from connectivity, and it's so interesting that we're in this hyper uh, connected world, and we're still talking about divides right? Like there are still people mm -hmm. and millions of people across the United States disconnected from basic internet access. It's layered based on what your lived experience that are, right? How you show up in the world. It could be environmental. It could be a parent and education and what that means and not having access. It's also impacted the workforce. It impacts our healthcare system. Like everyone um, has been greatly affected in the past few months about discon disconnection to access to the things that we need in order to survive in a pandemic. But when we talk about historically, you know, the low income and then also black and brown communities have been largely impacted um, as cities were talking about becoming smart cities. But smart cities for whom is the question that I always ask when we're still trying to make sure that everyone has basic access to high speed internet and then basic access to the hardware in their homes or in their communities that they need to be an active participant and a financial beneficiary of the innovation economy. Eric, I wanna ask you, coming from the, the, the health care sphere, you know, uh, how and why has the pandemic made this divide greater? You know, Quantum Foundation, I want uh, just to give you some background, as a health mm -hmm. conversion foundation, which we were created out of the cell of a hospital here in, in Palm Beach County. And you think about healthcare and you wonder, you know, how, how is technology, other than telemedicine, which is a huge part of it, but how, how is technology uh, really interrupting or has interrupted the whole scope and sphere of life for individuals? You know, in the last couple of decades in healthcare, particularly, we talk more not just about health as a function or absence of disease, a function of doctors and nurses and places where people go for health care, but rather we talk about it as the social influences that uh, are the socio-ecological factors. For instance, where people live, um, their employment status, their education status. Uh, one of the things I often think about in our work here at Quantum is, is the statement that was made by Harvard uh, School of Public Health in 2014 when they said your zip code is a better determinant of your life outcomes than your genetic code. And so what we realized mm -hmm. was that when the pandemic hit, not only were there those who were left out on the margins of testing and access to medical care, but we also, as Felicia pointed out, we realized that there were gonna be those who didn't have access to the age of technology as a way forward. So when we talk about the social determinants of health, housing, many of the housing applications now uh, or assistance for housing is online. Think about those families who don't have access to the internet or the hardware within their homes or the knowledge of how to use it. But it's not just healthcare and housing, banking, uh, employment, all of these important social factors that influences a person's health outcome, it's all been disrupted. 
I wanted to throw out something I had heard about years ago, but never seemed to catch on and never seemed to get too far. Don, I don't know what the word was. It's, it was my fi Wi-Fi. I don't know what the word was, but it was citywide Wi-Fi where people didn't have to worry about that. But that seemed to disappear. That idea for it disappear or or what? I mean, there's there's major players in, in pulling that type of uh, widespread internet access off. Um, you have the telecommunications and the FCC and city municipalities, uh, county governments, state governments. It, it became a great challenge. In fact, when the South Florida Digital Alliance was first founded, that was part of our conversation that we brought together the major players with Miami-Dade County, with the city of Miami, local universities and corporations to uh, expand the internet access to underserved populations throughout our community. And so this was started with the great idea and we started delivering internet, but it really became too complicated to pull off. And so what we started to look for and shift our vision to that of uh, getting internet to public parks and public um, facilities to where uh, individuals and uh, citizens and neighbors in our communities can go and access the internet if they could not get it at their house. Uh, and that was then followed up and supported with programs offered by telecommunication providers like Comcast with internet essentials. So in, in many ways, it was let those who understood the markets and who were putting out the infrastructure like Comcast, let them help deliver internet and get it more accessible to families in need than for government entities and uh, some of the smaller nonprofits. I mean, it was a hard uh, challenge for us as a nonprofit to, to really play in that market. Uh, so we defer to uh, those with more expertise, but certainly it is a challenge because you will see and hear conversations uh, where even if you give a family a device, so they have a computer or tablet at home, uh, without internet access, it, the device is lifeless. Now, before we continue, let's hear how the Miami Foundation is helping address the digital divide by supporting local nonprofits with their latest grants. My name is Cherise Grants, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Programs and Grants Administration at the Miami Foundation. The Miami Foundation's decision to focus on digital access was one of what we felt are the most important current and long-term issues we're going to have to deal with. What immediately happened with the onset of the pandemic and the community restrictions meant that individuals who had been relying on nonprofits for services were cut off. And the nonprofits were cut off from those they needed to serve. The Miami Foundation launched the Community Recovery Fund. We carved out some of the funding to be able to award these mini grants into neighborhoods where we knew the need was high and we knew that the lack of digital access was going to be dramatic to afford them some opportunity to be able to pivot to virtual and continue to serve as many folks as they can. But we needed to try at least to find organizations that were embedded in these neighborhoods, organizations that had been there, had the trust of residents, had relationships with those they serve, who we could try to help them flip to a virtual world. And the challenges that they faced in doing that were fairly enormous. The Opelika CDC has been an organization the foundation has invested in over the years, um, particularly just because of the role they play in a community that so badly needs a nonprofit champion. My name is Nikisha Williams. I am the Chief Operating Officer of the Opelaka Community Development Corporation. While it was very easy for much of South Florida or much of the country to transition to working from home or school from home, that was not easy in black and brown for particularly poor communities because they just didn't have the resources that they needed. And in addition, because of the fact that all of a sudden everybody needed a computer, there also were just no resources in the sense that it was just hard to get your hands on a computer if you really needed it. The FIU Metropolitan Center had released a really valuable report based on um, U.S. Census 2018 estimates 
In the city of Miami, we're looking at close to 32% of residents who are not connected to the internet in terms of race and ethnicity, the numbers were even more challenging. So only about 5% of white households don't have access to internet. Hispanic households, about 20%. And for black households, it goes all the way up to almost 36%. Those are the very same neighborhoods where the pandemic hit them harder so to not have that connectivity was incredibly, incredibly challenging. The unfortunate part is that you have this huge gap of kids who aren't really able to get on the internet and aren't really able to continue learning because of a digital divide that has been growing for so many years now. We were lucky enough to receive a technology grant from the Miami Foundation. And, you know, when we submitted our application, we were very honest about the need in our communities. And we were able to buy, I believe, a hundred tablets and donate them to the charter school here in Opelika to allow uh, those students to help get online. We're having conversations um, with partners about, is there a way to build the dream of can we intervene in this issue of how do we reduce the disparity of connectivity? Like, is that a policy solution? Is that like, what is it? Because what we can do right now and what we will do is we will do our best to buy time, to buy organizations time to continue to operate until something shifts. We have to think about it like an essential um, utility, the way we think about electricity, for example, and having phone communication and getting your mail. As a society, we have to begin to treat it as such and we need to make sure that everyone has easy access to it for the purposes that they need, whether it be work or education. And so my hope is that with this, we will get closer to solving that digital divide. Now, Nikisha mentioned uh, looking at digital access um, uh, there as an essential utility, something that we've heard from other places. Uh, Don, let's stick with you on this one. Do you agree and could this help with maybe finding a long-term, I don't know, policy solution for the divide as Sharice mentioned? I think what happened is the, the shutdown. So we, we've been around for about 11 years now. And um, I just like a personal like antidote here is that we'd always get a nice pat on the back for what we were doing um, and giving out hardware and trying to help bridge the digital divide. Um, and other things like the programs and educations uh, really took the stage, which they deserve a lot of support. And um, then all of a sudden March comes along and it brought forth a realization of how dependent public programs and services have become on technology and internet access. And so uh, my phone starts you know, going, ringing off the hook and emails start flying in as fast and furious about trying to get uh, computers, trying to help with internet access, whether it's uh, you know, with internet essentials or with uh, hotspots, uh, to get these things out there as quickly as possible because of how dependent it was. And it wasn't just schools. It wasn't um, just the government. It was everything. So you know, we talked about the health care. It was uh, you know, paying your taxes. Uh, it was participating in after-school programs. We had nonprofits calling us. Uh, because they could not get to their constituents. And so, yes, mm -hmm. I, I think that to bridge the digital divide, we are looking at a multi-part equation. Internet access and devices are but one part of the digital literacy. It is not just an option anymore to participate in society and have a quality of life. It's not an option not to have internet and not to have a computer in your house. And I saw personally that the Mind Foundation has turned and started to look at some of these challenges the right way and targeting uh, the right things so that we can really connect this community. You know, Eric, I think this is a good good uh, spot to really talk about what you guys are doing with Quantum uh, and uh, in helping trying to bridge this. We looked at the data here in Palm Beach County, we're about 20% disconnected for the entire county. The majority of the uh, African American and Latin communities, but higher disconnectivity in in the, the Black and African American community. In Palm Beach County, a person in this 20% of disconnectivity earn about 2.3 times less in terms of annual income. 
in terms of education, four times less likely to earn a bachelor's degree when digitally disconnected. And then lastly, mm -hmm. uh, live about 8.4 years less. And what we've done here at Quantum Foundation, we're leading a, a, pilot, a piloted effort in partnership with our county around community technology navigators. They're creating a mesh of broadband that's free to communities, those in low-income communities, and that mesh is received in the households. But then the question is, are the people in the households digitally literate? And so the navigators that we're now funding through a group called Community Partners of South Florida, they will hire three community technology navigators in three distinct census tracts, areas within the county, where they'll go in like what we did with health navigators, and they'll help families with things like learning how to use it for telemedicine, Zooming with your school teachers, using it for right. prescription, uh, refilling prescriptions, or for any of these social factors that influences health. Valicia, let me, get, let me get you in on this too, because the image that I cannot get out of my mind as we, as we talk here is a story that I saw a couple of weeks ago about uh, some young kids who, uh, who did not have internet access they're forced to sit outside of a Starbucks and use that Wi-Fi to do their homework. So talk to me about the whole utility, essential utility thing in your mind. Over the past six years since we started Code Fever and now with the Center for Black Innovation has always been about ridding black communities from being innovation deserts and being mm -hmm. disconnected from the innovation economy, but not looking at the big technology companies to solve this problem and not having our government solve this problem, because just like Don said, it's been very much from a grassroots level, but are we thinking about connectivity and resources and infrastructure on a local level? And the answer is no, right? And so we have very poor infrastructure. Uh, we don't really truly support the innovation economy in the way where everyone can say that they are in line with being able to be globally competitive in the region that, mm. that we're in. And and lies the problem. And so this is something that has always existed. And now, like everyone is saying, has been exacerbated under a pandemic, or now we have to rely on technology to connect our businesses, to connect our young people so that there's not a learning drain in the process, making sure that from a medical standpoint, everyone has what they need and can access. These are things that could have been prevented. And so it's looking at technology, innovation, and the digital divide um, from a more of a holistic and human-centered approach about are we servicing the whole person, not looking at technology as being this thing over here, but fully integrated into how we um, are better servicing our people so that they have and are easily connected to everything that they need. Because at the end of the day, this is not a technology, just a technology issue. We are losing lives because of a lack of a technology mm -hmm. infrastructure. And this is where we are right now. Oh, I really want to talk more about that, more talk about that, but we need to move things along here. So another population that uh, has long struggled with living in this, you know, digital world of seniors, and all of us uh, have parents. Uh, in Palm Beach County, a local high school student has taken it upon himself, with the help of other students, to provide free technical assistance to seniors in need. Let's take a look at their story. And my name is William Shulman. I live in West Palm Beach. I live at Moore's Life. When I grew up, we didn't have computers. And I'm absolutely amazed and delighted and astounded at the beauty of what a computer can do. Those of us who are really not computer educated, we probably, and I know I have this tendency, push buttons that we shouldn't be pushing. And all of a sudden, something happens. And Sam came into more slides with a flyer saying that he would help seniors with their computers and iPhones. And I needed help. I got a phone call, oh, okay. and it was, it's definitely a, uh, what do you call it, a scam type. Okay. Every My name is Sam Friedman. I'm a junior at Suncoast High School, and I'm the founder and president of South Florida Tech for Seniors. We help senior citizens with technical problems ranging from not knowing how to push the on button on their laptop, to connecting their printer to the internet, removing viruses from their computer, dealing with malware attacks, or even just video chatting with grandkids. 
I've always been good at technology and I've always helped out my family members. And particularly it's been my grandparents who have had the most problems out of anyone. So when I realized how many problems they had and how many people are like them who don't have somebody like me to help out, that's what really inspired me to start this organization. I just had an experience with Sam yesterday where I was just having a lot of problems with the computer. I called him and he got onto my computer remotely and one, two, three, he fixed all my problems. Now, I really can't understand what he does, but I think it's just short of brilliance. And I'm very, I'm very uh, happy that he has the knowledge. When I say he, I really mean he and his colleagues, because I've worked with Sam, but a lot of people here have worked with some of his colleagues to help solve their problems. And I know that listening to the residents here, they're enamored and just love the work that he does for us. Many of the other students we work with are also computer science majors at my high school and other high schools. And they're all very happy that they can do something that for them is pretty easy to do. It doesn't require a lot of hard work, but it can be very meaningful in the lives of senior citizens to which technology is completely foreign. Since the pandemic, we've transitioned from in-person learning to remote learning. We've also been working on making free videos that provide tips and tricks for common features on common devices like how to use FaceTime and connect to Wi-Fi so that way seniors can watch these videos back and be able to follow them along. Personally, to just see these seniors smile when they learn about the selfie camera on their phone that they didn't know was there before or learn about a new function on their computer or when they finally figure out how to join a Zoom call, it really makes me happy and I think it really makes all of us happy and you can show how such a simple thing can make such a big difference in their lives. Wow, that was, a, that was inspiring. Um, uh, Eric, when it comes to the senior population, you know, being cut off from the world has some significant effects, I believe, on health and well-being. So can you talk about this and maybe how it relates to some of your, your, your initiatives and stuff with the Quantum Foundation? Yeah, so if we think about it, one of the first things that uh, we heard about the virus was if you're you know, over 65 years old, that you're at higher risk. And obviously, not obviously, but also if you have any other underlying conditions, chronic or medical conditions. So you start thinking about mm -hmm. our senior population, over 65, and those are, that's the, one of the more at-risk populations. So these are the populations now that are, many of them were homebound prior to and their medical appointments may have been one of the few times that they would get out, but now even that medical appointment has been uh, uh, digitalized, if you will, or digitized. Um, Sam, in that video, which I love, what Sam is doing is the same thing that we're calling a community tech navigator, going and working with individuals, whether a senior or a, a student or a, a working mom or dad who just doesn't have the computer literacy or the skill to adopt that device. Uh, for their for their long term use, I wanted to ask Don about this as well, and because I just I guess when I think about seniors, it seems kind of ironic that they are the ones who kind of who can kind of afford it. So, do you see some? Uh, boy, I hate to say this, that uh, that the pandemic provides an opportunity here. I think it does provide opportunity, um, but it also uh, maybe to your point, it's it's maybe not the affordability, although for some it still is. Um, for a lot yes. of them, it's it's fear over it's overcoming fear, and um, fear of the device. And what we found is that when you sit down with them and work with them, uh, and you identify an interest, all of a sudden their eyes open up, and they become much more comfortable in using technology. COVID, in particular, while it highlighted their disconnect, it also made it more challenging for us. At the same time, the South Florida Digital Alliance was hosting a workshop for senior citizens from their iPhones to setting up emails to connecting to banks. We were working with them and all of a sudden we had to stop. We could not meet together as a group. And it, it was kind of funny. It was like a uh, local barbershop yeah. conversation <laughs> together and talk. So quality of life is a big thing for senior citizens. The social connection, being able to connect wow. to your family or friends, asking everyone to stay at home, but wait a second, you're by yourself or you're, you're in a, 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 a nursing home or something. 
How do you connect with your friends and family? So social connection is huge. Uh, Felicia, I thought uh, I thought you wanted to jump in here on that. Uh, can you you want to add to this? I think the two gentlemen said everything right um, around just kind of connectivity around security. Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that a program that would have existed without the pandemic? But now it does. And this human centered way of getting the technology and the resources that we need directly to people um, and kind of taking this, you know, offline, off, taking it offline is, is something that has an opportunity that can be expanded upon even when we're not in the midst of a pandemic. And so we have to look at those things as kind of silver lining of what is possible when we are addressing problems and we're solving problems um, in the times that we need the most in some of our most vulnerable populations. I see kids, you know, kids of color with cell phones, you know, who know how to use them. Do they know, for example, that that cell phone could be used as a hotspot, you know, to do so mm -hmm. rather than sitting outside of McDonald's and using their right. Wi-Fi. Also, there's a level of literacy that we need to get to as well. Eric, can you talk about that a little bit? I don't believe that this would be happening now were it not for the pandemic, that we now see this great need. Um, and that's exactly right. You know, the, the fifth area that we are looking at or this area that we're looking at uh, after infrastructure and quality devices and the, the, the actual uh, broadband and affordability of that, when we start talking about usability and adoptability, a lot of this is just basic information and education. I keep going back to the young, young man, Sam, who was showing the seniors some things that look, the, the technology is in our hands. We're not using it at its full capacity. And I love what Don keeps coming back to, and that's quality of life. And what we say at Quantum is we want to be, to use medical terms, the connective tissue to improve quality of life. And this digital access, and we'll now call it not digital divide, but digital access and equity, brings an opportunity for individuals. And one of the best things that I would say about this, poverty is usually situated in place in a defined geography. The opportunity now is you can transcend the place where you live because that internet can take you wherever your mind wants to go. And that's what the digital literacy is all about. It's using, it's not just using, but adopting the full capacity of the devices. Yeah, absolutely. Rick, that's, that's what I think our, our, our hope was with technical training and coding programs, right? Like at okay. its core, we want people to more, be more analytical and logistical thinkers. Um, and that's what understanding technology is supposed to provide, right? And so I think one of the, my biggest frustrations kind of around the digital divide is most young people have cell phones. And it's also the thing that is usually taken away on their campus, in their classrooms, instead of saying like, hey, in the lack of having a computer, your phone is a computer, right? Like our phones have more technology than most computers had 20 years, all computers had 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Right. And so disconnect from saying, I cannot use this technology tool in the classroom. And then all of a sudden we expect them to now know what to do with it outside of the classroom when they've been ingrained that this is not a tool of education is a, a part of why we are, we are now here, right? And so they have it. Um, and, you know, when we run our Code Fever programs and we ask students questions and we're like, you know, tell us who founded like this technology company and no one raises their hand. And I'm like, but you have a phone that you can look for the answer and knowing that they have the permission to find the answers in the device that is front in front of them. And it's almost like we're trained. We have to train our young people to solve for the open book test because that is what it is right now. When they get into their careers, it's about how resourceful can you be? Can you get the answer? Mm -hmm. It's not about memorization. It's about the utility and knowing what to do with the, do what with the resources that you have so that you become re resourceful and you become valuable within the innovation economy. Well, that's a great piece of advice to, to end on, unfortunately. We're out, of, <laughs> we're out of time for tonight's town hall. So thank you to you guys, uh, Felicia Hatcher, uh, with uh, Code Fever Miami and Black Tech Week, Eric Kelly, uh, president of the Quantum Foundation in Palm Beach County, and Don Slesnick, executive director of the South Florida Digital Alliance. Thanks for joining us. You can watch the full town hall on our Facebook page at Your South FL. Stay well, and thanks for watching.